thank you everyone. A call to order the um, Townwide Budget Balancing Committee um, and our meeting on Wednesday, March 4th, 2020. Um, the first order of business is approval of minutes from the March 6th meeting. That was way back last year. <laughs> um, is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Bob. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right, thank you. Anne, all in favor? Uh, unanimous. All right, great, thank you. Um, I, with the committee's permission, I'd like to take things slightly out of order and talk about the um, first pass FY21 budget um, revenue estimates and things like that before we talk about the Chapter 70. All right, Mr. McQuaid. Uh, thank you. So uh, this is the traditional sheet that people are used to oh. seeing every year. Yeah, we can pass this out for everybody. Uh, okay. So this top section is revenue. So line one is non-utility revenue, also known as departmental receipts. So this includes like ambulance receipts and building permits, et cetera. So we're pass these to the gallery. Uh, in, uh, in this budget, we're, we're proposing to use 90% of what we actually receive in fiscal 19, which is the year just completed. So if I just flip over here to uh, this column C here. This is the, the actual local receipts in that year, which was 16834000 uh, But when we're doing budgeting, it's, it's always uh, good to be conservative because, as we've seen the last couple of, uh, last couple of days, the stock market kind of crashed. It's volatile. You know, if that happens, maybe people won't buy motor vehicles and the excise taxes won't be as high next year. So uh, so our, our long-term goal in our new financial policies is to use 90% on the budget. Uh, so that uh, this chart just shows that if you look at, uh, I don't know if you can see row 23, but basically if you're starting at uh, in column D, that, that's 100%. If you use 100%, it's 16,834,000. If you use 98%, it's 16,533,000. So basically, each percentage point, and these are in two percent increments, is about $150,000. So $300,000 for each of these. So for instance, if we went from a 90% estimate, which I'm recommending in this model, we would be using 15,330. If someone suggested we use 92%, we'd be using 15,631. So I'm just gonna go back to the front page again. Just Maya? a quick question on that. Um, it's also possible that revenues go up. They have gone up year to year. Um, so if we budgeted 15.3 million, but then we actually got 17 million, um, that just rolls into free cash the following year, That's right? Correct. Okay. 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 So back to the summer sheet. So then uh, the next section is on our revenue <coughs> is that utility revenue, which uh, is kind of uh, an independent calculation mm -hmm. by the light department, the water department, and broadband, and what they need to uh, to uh, meet their marks every year. So. We, as a committee, don't have any control over those numbers. Uh, uh, row 15, I don't know if you can see way in the left there, the, the row numbers, but it's also cited as number seven on, on the chart on column C, is the state cherry sheet. So that, this is the local aid. And you can see in uh, our budget for fiscal 19 was 11,871,000. We got a big bump last year, kind of surprised at the end. We went up to 13.4, and uh, we got an even bigger bump. Uh, the Chapter 70 portion, which is related to activities at the school, actually I think went up 19 percent. Yes. Um, this year, and uh, with it came some mandates. Uh, one of one of which is the School Opportunities Act, which. We're kind of estimating it's going to cost us six hundred thousand uh, dollars. So, where even though we got more money, some of it is dedicated money, uh, which relates to a bigger discussion about you know we have an MOU, which has a three and a half percent 
maximum for the general government and three and a half percent for the schools. Uh, you know, I think no one really thought about it, a new, new mandated program that came with funding. So I, I think uh, the various boards have been discussing this, and that seems pretty clear that if you have to do it and you have the money, then it has to go over the three and a half percent. So that's, I think, kind of a non-argument, but uh, at least I haven't heard any objection to that. Um, so that's uh, 15150, which is quite a bit of difference uh, from la from prior year. Uh, and then let's go down here, uh, and then uh, we expect to get uh, 88 million dollars in uh, tax revenue. So. Uh, this model says, uh, you know, maybe we, want, we, we could leave $100,000 of untaxed to, to get a balanced budget. Uh, and then down below, uh, I'm, I'm putting this year's source of revenues deposit on Forbes. So uh, this is an open question, and that's why it's a budget, not a uh, after-the-fact thing, is uh, right now we have deposits of $625,000, which are non-forfeitable. Uh, the purchaser of Forbes has until March 31st to actually complete the transaction. Uh, it, if he does so, then we'll have to change estimates on our cost side, et cetera, going forward because we wouldn't have to pay as much on bonds. But right now, this is taking the conservative approach and saying that, you know, we're going to still have to pay those uh, bond expenses going forward. So if that happens, I'm recommending that town meeting takes the action of <coughs> designating that deposit for revenue for, uh, against next year's budget. So, um, and then these are, uh, I kind of skipped over the free cash. So last year we used uh, free cash on, in two ways. So one was, people may recall that the, uh, when we were formulating the budget, we had to process the whole budget not knowing whether an override would pass. So at that time, uh, the Finance Commission agreed, uh, and the Selectmen and the School Committee, to take an additional $509,290 and give it to the schools uh, as, you know, so they wouldn't have to cut as many programs. So uh, with the kind of agreement that if the override passed, then somehow they would give that money back to us, which they actually did in the fall town meeting. <coughs> so uh, we had already authorized the $700,000 override fund, and then this 509-290 was added to that. So uh, okay. last year we counted that as a source of revenue. That's not a relevant thing this year, so we're not using any free cash related to that. And also, uh, the FinCom was, uh, even last year, we thought there was a possibility that Forbes would, sale would happen during the year. So uh, the principal and interest and operating costs of Forbes last year, uh, we took out of free cash. So it wouldn't uh, you know, be taken away from departments. And so neither of those happened this year. Uh, one of our goals is to uh, and the new policies is to not use free cash to balance the budget, and, and in this budget we don't we don't do so. So, so that's a, another good thing. Uh, uh, item 18, cemetery transfer. Uh, we're doing something, Tony, with the uh, transfer that's going to cause us to not have as much revenue. Can you maybe explain that? The uh, well, we're transfer is a reimbursable mm -hmm. cab program. We actually don't expend the full amount every year, so we're um, decreasing some of it in the expense budget, which is in the senior center budget, and moving it over to some other programs in the senior center. It decreases the, the corresponding revenue amount, but I don't think that revenue amount's been a real amount for several years. Yeah. It's only about $30,000 total, mainly because we haven't actually used the full transfer program, so we don't actually spend all of the, uh, the tickets that we purchase. But collectively, we're trying to just reduce that this line on revenue by $10,000 from 135 to 125, um, and then every year we get uh, some grant reimbursements from the uh, 
for that cover benefits on uh, grants at the schools. So we're using $150,000 for that. Uh, we're taking the same amount of AMR water re receipts, $670,000. So collectively, you can see last year we had other source of revenue of a million nine fifty-one. This year we only have a million five seventy. And uh, but in total we have estimated revenues of two hundred and six million uh, one ninety and. Just scooting down to the bottom line here, uh, we have 206199 of expenses. So uh, right now I'm, I'm budgeting a, a $9,000 loss. So that's a, obviously a rounding error and that we, it's not worth trying to pin down until we, uh, you know, do specific budgets. So, uh, and I know the schools are working on specific budgets and I know the general manager's already presented his. So. Um, are there any questions? Anybody? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, I had asked for uh, in for a discussion of Chapter 70 briefly at this meeting. So um, mm -hmm. in your packet that's stapled together, you sh I think there's the... Oh, this doesn't have the Chapter 70, the foundation budget calculations. Did we, did we send had that as part of the packet, I thought? Maybe it's... I had emailed them to everyone. But, um, but we do have the cherry sheets that we can look at, but I would like to get everybody to look uh, at that. Tony's going to see if he can find it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, let's look a bit at the cherry sheet first, and then um, maybe we can look at the foundation budget. So, oh, you've got, I you've got copies. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, so. I can probably put local aid up here. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so the, um, so just to remind everyone, the, the foundation budget is the, um, calculation that the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, does every year to determine how much they think we, like a minimum amount that each school district needs to spend on their schools. And in order to, can I borrow that for just a minute, Bob? <laughs> so um, in order to come up with the foundation budget, they look at um, the number of pupils in a school at the preschool level, the kindergarten level, elementary, middle school, high school, if there's vocational school. Um, then they add a certain percentage that they assume are special education students. That's not based on your actual numbers. That's based on a, an assumption. But then they add an additional increment for any English language learners that a district has. Um, those are actual numbers based on the number of tested students and their, the, their test results. Um, and then there's an additional increment for um, the number of low-income students that a district has. And um, from that, they determine the, the total enrollment. They determine a foundation budget. There's a few other factors, like where in the state you are, because wages are different closer to Boston than they are out on the west, western Massachusetts, things like that. So um, when they come up with this uh, foundation budget, and that um, creates a minimum amount of, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, net minimum spending or something like that. And then, based on that number, they come up with a Chapter 70 reimbursement for each town. So um, if you, we do have copies of the cherry sheets, mm -hmm. if everybody's got them. Okay. Oh, good. All right, so the cherry sheets are up here, too. So um, there's two pages. One is where the... Um, the estimated receipts is in like a lighter color. That's actually the one that shows the estimated receipts, I think because it's like blue or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the other one shows the estimated assessments and charges, mm -hmm. just so you can see both of those. And these um, have the FY20 numbers and then the FY21, the governor's budget proposal. Um, that does not, <coughs> that's typically a minimum level. Thank you, Tony. Um, and um, beyond that, it 
uh, typically the House and the Senate raise that number a little bit, and then there's some final negotiations. But the final negotiations don't happen until July. So we work with the governor's numbers. But if you look at um, the Chapter 70 number, you'll see that the um, the Chapter 70 reimbursement for Norwood is proposed to be $1.5 million higher than it was last year. As uh, Mr. McQuaid said, that's an increase of 19%. Um, you'll notice that if you look at the net aid that we get from the state, you look at the um, assessments, the estimated receipts, and you subtract out the assessments and charges, Chapter 70 represents almost 75% of our net state aid. So that aid is really targeted for, um, or the state is suggesting that that should be used for education. The this year, we've seen a significant increase for a couple of reasons. One is that there was a new law signed, the Student Opportunity Act, which is increasing the, which is changing the formula and increasing the reimbursement for a lot of districts, maybe all districts. Um, and the other thing is that we are seeing some um, increases in our needs in our student population. So if you look at these two sheets that you're getting now, the FY20 Chapter 70 Foundation budget and the FY21 at Chapter 70 Foundation budget. I know it's small. You can see all this on the DESE website if you really want to like look at bigger versions of it. But that first line in the spreadsheet is the foundation enrollment, and it shows you the different types of students. So um, the things to notice for the Norwood schools are that our enrollment has increased by about 2%. When they're doing the FY21 calculations, they base that on our enrollment as of October 1st on 2019. That's just their cutoff date. Um, so our enrollment has increased overall by about 2%. Um, our low income number is now about 31%. You can't compare that directly to the last year because they did change the formula. But if you look at the increment of the FY21 foundation budget for low income, that is adding $4.9 million to our foundation budget, which is $786 million, oh, sorry, $786,000 over the FY20. So there, the state is expecting that our expenses will be going up, be partly due to that. The other thing to notice is that the ELL number, the English language learner, increased from 340 students to 443 students. And the increment and in the foundation budget that's related to the English language learners is um, over $1 million. And it's $257,000 more than it was in FY20. So the state numbers are telling us that they think that our costs will have gone up by about, or you could argue that they're saying that the costs could have gone up by about $257,000 due to the increase in English language learners of about 30% round numbers. So just a lot of things to look at there. But um, Norwood is very fortunate that we are looking at an additional $1.5 million in Chapter 70 funding. But um, as Mr. McQuaid alluded to, it does come with strings. So um, Dr. Thompson passed around the sheet that looks like this. So OK. Um, so Dr. Thompson, do you want to talk about this? I was just going to say you have some extra. Oh, so in the few more in the gallery. So this is from the, uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed looking at uh, the increase in our Chapter 70 aid. And you can <clears> see these are the uh, districts, and it does go on the back side. These are the districts that um, have received over $1.5 million, which means that we have to have a long-form plan or a more detailed plan. And you can see all the districts. I think there's about 17 <coughs> or 20 in there uh, out of 351 that have qualified for uh, the higher Chapter 70 reimbursement. Norwood is at the bottom because uh, we get our, our the least out of all of these. The most is Lynn. Uh, Lynn is um, is receiving 30 million 196 increase in Chapter 70. And you can see how it drops 
drops down. So we are at the bottom. Randolph is just above us. They're getting 1.546 million. We're getting 1.53 million. Um, and then the next two columns, the next column over, that 970,868 is the maximum we can use to um, recommend that we can use towards ongoing expenses. And then to the far right, that 564,886 is the minimum to use towards the student Opportunity Act plan. Um, so the strings attached to this increase in Chapter 70 money is that we have to find a group that is not achieving with their peers and identify programs and develop a plan that's measurable to start closing that gap. Um, so the administration and the system in general are in process of that. We have identified our group, which is special ed. Special ed represents 20.7% of our overall population, meaning one in five is qualifying for special education services. Um, and we are looking at increasing our early literacy programming in the, uh, pre in the early childhood and elementary level, increasing co-teaching where we have students in regular classrooms with support at the middle school, uh, and looking at inclusive practices and mental health programming at the high school to help close those gaps. So we're in the process of developing that um, with a goal of spending about 600000 uh, to do that. The nice piece of, of this money is that we are allowed to take some things that are in our base budget and move them over, supplant is the... Uh, you know, but we're also, that that's not enough. It's not that you can just say, oh, 600000 of spending we already have in the budget because you've got to design a plan that's probably more vigorous than what we currently have in the budget, and we need to be make it measurable, um, and it needs to be a two-year plan. So we're hoping that around <coughs> 300000 of that six hundred will be things that are in the budget, and we're going to be expanding some of the programming that we were going to start next year. May I ask a question? You can. And I, you may have covered it, but I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> why were we on this short list? Why are we on this short list? Because of the increase in our high needs population. Okay. Thank you. And so high needs is defined as? As low income, ELL, special education. Okay. So does, does that also, well, the 970 in the second to last column for ongoing expenses, is that also due to those factors as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there um, stipulations by the state that they must be used, that money must be used for that population, or do they try the, the, to? No, it's a recalculation of the formula. The, the state's right. finally trying to address the fact that for years they've had a formula where they say, all right, it's it's... Special ed increases at 2% a year, and it's never increased at 2% mm -hmm. a year. So it's their first year really trying to, or second technically, at really trying to address just the general school aid and what they calculated on and, and what the per pupil costs are for a special ed student. So, so those populations tend to need more intense services, which cost more. So if you have more students that need more intense services, then your costs go up. That combined, you know, part of the reason why I don't think the state um, attached strings to that money is that generally, you know, the schools and the superintendents and the school committees have been talking about the increasing costs around employment and 80% of our budget is we need people to do the teaching, um, are associated with, with those costs. So that's, that's a piece of it as well. So I think probably a lot of you know that the school committee just recently attended the FinCom meeting Monday night. We went into the, the budget, a lot of these budget drivers in a lot of detail, and that wasn't my intent for today. But I did think it's important as we're talking about the override pledge and as Mr. McQuay talking about the 3.5% cap, I just wanted everyone to understand how this new legislation at the state level is impacting both our revenues and our requirements. and. Um, as you look at the override pe pledge, which is on the last page of your larger packet, um, you'll notice that number six says that the agreement will be reviewed if substantial changes are made to state funding um, and or other unfunded mandates having a financial impact on the town or other extraordinary or unforeseen events. So I feel like given that our chapter 70 finance funding is going up almost 20%, um, and is some of it's coming with some strings attached, this is a good uh, justification to say that falls under this substantial changes to state funding. And as Mr. McQuaid suggested, it seems reasonable that that 
$600,000 should be excluded from the 3.5% the cap. But I didn't want to, anybody to think that we had, were just ignoring the 3.5% cap. But it's important to remember that the 3.5% number is a cap based on available revenues. This happens to be a good revenue year. Yeah. So if it hadn't been a good revenue year, if the state hadn't adjusted the formula, 3.5% may not be available. So it seems like it's this number on top of the 3.5%, but it just as easily could have been 3.5% up, could have been 2% down if revenues had been down, and it would have been different. So it's just specific to this year. Okay, do, um, so that's what I wanted to look at for Chapter 70. Are there other questions about um, the first pass of the budget? Um, Mr. McQuid, where are we at with um, shared expenses and um, benefit costs and things like that? Or do we think that our 5% estimate is going to be <coughs> adequate? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> I think that's the first time we've ever heard that. <laughs> well, partly we because heard that we, because, yeah. well, and because the budget balancing is starting in March. Yes. Usually we have this conversation in January and nobody knows. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we did, am I correct, Mr. Cooper? We, we did get the rates for the GIC, so. Well, technically they still have the sent to us because of the add on for the municipalities, but we know what they are. Okay. So, so we know, but they haven't told us. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, you, you budgeted by uh, away the pay at five percent for for a right. You, and it, it actually happened to come in a little less than five, yeah. I think. So. Yeah, it's it's. We think what's. I mean, again, open enrollment. You never can tell. It it should come in a hair under five. We'd like to keep the five in there because we do have some positions that were added last year that weren't included. We know there's a potential of some positions being added this year, so we don't want to lose the buffer that we have in there. Um, but that being said, it might end up coming in the, the absent any enrollment changes at 4.8, uh, 4.7, best case scenario. It's not going to accidentally be two with a giant surplus in there. It's going to be within, almost really within the margin of error. Okay. Any other questions? General questions? And, yeah. And just, a, just before you did that, Bill, uh, <coughs> the re retirement increase this year, I forget the percent, but it was Relative reasonable. It was around 5%. So. Um, that's those are the two big numbers. Great, Bill. So thank you. Um, I read through most of this stuff, but I didn't do the line by line detail uh, at this point. And and the uh, write ups that I guess it was Tony's no Tom's write up, um, page two near the bottom, calls for no free cash. So what are we proposing about free cash capital items? Uh, the proposal that I'm putting forward before capital outlay uh, <coughs> later this week has about we have 3.4 million in free cash. We'll be spending between 2.6 and 2.7 million on capital. What that allows us to do is the only items we're borrowing for are an ambulance and building construction projects. So a lot of smaller projects, design and vehicles and everything, we're paying cash. <coughs> There'll also need to be about um, maybe two to three hundred thousand dollars of transfers from free cash. The general fund owes the cemetery fund $140,000-ish. Um, we have the exact number. It's written down. Uh, and then the general fund actually owes the light department $100,000. Um, that's We've been booking a light department rental revenue for the, um, the print shop to the general fund. It's supposed to be a light department revenue. In a weird way, that'll come back to free cash anyway. But we want to actually make the transfer, show that we voted and did the transfer, and be able to put it in our file that we did it. That way, um, as we get audited, it's a we found an error, we corrected an error, even though the net impact at the end is going to be the same. With those two items, plus leaving a little bit of a buffer in the event um, we need anything for the special in the spring, um, we'd be looking at trying to keep half a million dollars in free cash, which is consistent with our financial policy. That's a floor. We'd like it to be higher, but it's also it's a good year that we're able to pay for a majority of our capital um, with uh, with cash, especially some of the smaller items. So the rest of that sentence <coughs> says that we're going to add seven hundred thousand to the new school override stabilization fund. So we're creating a new stabilization. Uh, no, sorry. By new, I believe Tom meant the, the override stabilization fund we established. Yeah, because that wasn't schools; that was general government and schools. Yeah, it's. 
Was that seven hundred thousand? That's just within the budget we had enough money that you didn't have to take that from free cash. Or? Uh, correct. So the the FY twenty one budget has a line in it for seven hundred thousand dollars for the override stabilization. Uh, I believe Tom's proposal put six hundred thousand into it. Oh. Yeah. Um, here. So, so six. Here no, it that's a six. So oh, we had seven. Oh, here it is. This one. <laughs> no. Yeah, it was seven and six, and then there's an option to get a six. But that. I didn't bring the front page. I think it was David. Our our projection was that year two we probably have to only contribute three hundred yeah, fifty thousand. We're contributing either six or seven, depending on which option we go for. So that's we're exceeding our target with the override funding uh, for the second fiscal year. The override. So it's more money in than we projected, which is a. a a good target. And ba so basically, if that happens, we'll have al almost two million dollars in that fund because yeah. we had se basically seven seven and five zero nine two ninety. Mm -hmm. And if it, it, so, that's good news. I always seem to say, talk about good news and then tell you why it's bad. But as an example, <laughs> we know we had three out of district placements this year that are seven hundred thousand dollars. So if it seems like we're well, now we have all this money for the override stabilization fund. No, we're good, but that could very quickly come down in a tough budget year. Again, it, it's a good budget year revenue-wise. Um, we're able to make some investments, um, but had it not been a good year revenue-wise, we would have been in a much uh, more challenging situation. Okay, just a nitpicky thing. You also say additional temporary override stabilization fund. The override fund isn't override stabilization fund isn't temporary. It's a permanent. Well, you, you can call it a permanent fund, but in the five-year projection, we we think we could put money in for a while, and then we're hoping to make it last that's 10 that's years. That's not true, right? But to me, it's not like you're going to use it for anything other than balancing, balancing the budget. Right. Like, if I was an outside analyst, I, I wouldn't count it as part of our reserves. I wouldn't but, count as part of the reserves, but it's not temporary. It's meant to be used continually, like you say. Right, but once it's gone, years, not five it's gone. Right. Well, you can put more money into it, and it's not gone unless you go back to a, a I, override. I strike the word temporary. Unless you go to an override <laughs> and, and have it removed. <clears throat> I, I guess I was kind of on that spreadsheet I sent out, was really trying to indicate that, you know, our our financial policy goal is to have five percent in reserves, and if you don't count that, we have four and a half percent. So we're getting close to the minimum of five, but we're not there. I had hoped to be able to put another seven hundred thousand in the regular st stabilization fund, but how much are we? <laughs> We put the, 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 the amount we've been using. It's about the 428000 The policy we had or the practice we had. Once so we're Thompson finally putting made in. Us, made us aware of the uh, additional special ed things. That, when, that, when there is that, that was the end of that. So we are only putting in exactly what we put in the other years, the, the amount the of money from the correct. regular stabilization. Correct. Which is really the payback of the DPW. I think there's one more year left on that. And are we meeting our OPEB um, policies? Some of the, so as the financial policies, we'd wanted to begin increasing OPEB contributions. We yeah. may still be able to do it with utility funds. We've got to balance that with the rates. We did put in there um, in our financial policies that when we add positions, we want to be in costing out the full OPEB cost of them. That's not included in the budget, and the main reason is is that was added prior to the three and a half percent cap um, yeah. with the override. So that might be one of those policies that we have to look at as we sort of do a dashboard for our financial policies and say, you know, did not make progress on this this year, and the reason being, if we go back and adjust that, now it's you know that's another seventy thousand dollars out of a budget here or there. We need to pick and choose where we want to make big picture financial progress mm -hmm. on our uh, our policies. So I think when we have that dashboard sort of ready for town meeting, that here are all of our different goals. We're doing very good in most of them. We're very good in a lot of them. There are going to be some that don't necessarily um, we may not hit, and it may take us time. You're never going to have perfection achieved on all 15 different uh, you know fiscal goals or the policies. So under it, our obligation though, under the pledge is that we're not decreasing the. That it's not decreasing. No, same okay. as the, yeah. Um, any questions around the table and then so it, that was at the 90 percent correct if we went to 92 could we make our pledges to um, 
substantially start increasing our um, stabilization, a regular stabilization fund? So there's two, <coughs> sort of two answers to that. The short one is, of course, do we want to increase a revenue projection to have more money to put in here, knowing that we're just losing our free cash on the other side, so that in a subsequent year, are we going to be borrowing more and not having cash? So is it, it's always good to put money into the bank, but are we just saying, well, increase the revenue to increase a dump into this fund, but we know we're going to lose the revenue from somewhere else. It's less free cash we're going to generate. So that that's a, you could go either way. We could max revenues up to 100% and put a million dollars in a stabilization so fund and then lose, you know, do we lose it on the free cash? And where we got to be, one of the reasons other than being conservative with trying to hit 90 or 92% with local receipt projections, not only is the natural um, sort of gyrations they have, but if we ever had a year where we had negative free cash, you make that up in the subsequent year out of your operating budget. So if you find out you're down $900,000 in October or November, we're trying to cut $900,000 from the budget. Once you're several months into the fiscal year, then trying to make cuts from that existing budget that you already spent over half of your budget becomes incredibly challenging. So we always want a, a buffer built in there somewhere. Yeah, so I just wanted to open this up for discussion to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, we're 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 sort of skating by again on our stabilization fund, and I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that again because we certainly have over mm -hmm. the other years. Yeah, I think that's a good point. All right, any other questions? Phil? Well, I think you're about to recognize people, and I want to make a comment. Okay. Um, in the past, I think we've been, in the past years, I think we've had a bad habit of recognizing people from the audience. And most of the times, the people from the audience who choose to be recognized are other members of some of our boards. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, and then we respond, especially when it creates a majority um, of that board, we are treading on thin ice of having um, Deliberation. discussions and deliberation. So I would recommend that this is a committee and work should be within the committee. I definitely agree that uh, we need to be careful of open meeting law, and I think that we need to be careful not to deliberate as a group. Um, perhaps for today, since this has been our policy or sort of the practice of the Budget Balancing Committee, I will open it up to questions. If there's something where someone feels that there's some information we've discussed that's not clear and it's just a clarification, then we can do that. But I agree that debating with everyone in the room is dangerous in terms of open meeting law. So are there questions? Kelly. So basically, so if we choose to go with the conservative projections like our financial policy law and we get our 100%, we generate free cash at the end of the year. Wouldn't it make sense to then have some sort of policy, or do we have a policy that says if we generate X amount of free cash, we will then put Y percentage in our stabilization fund because we generated extra? Tony? So you, there are some hounds that do that. If the committee want to recommend that, some hounds always put a certain percentage into stabilization, into OPEB. One of the challenges is you never actually know you're going to generate free cash. You can reasonably assume you will. But those numbers are just projections, and where they come in and where they come in within those projections, you actually have a, you know, it's your best guesstimate. So you could always say X percentage of money should go into stabilization. <coughs> Here again, where your decision point is, well, great, every year, and a lot of towns do this, it's actually a good idea to say, well, 10% of stabilization goes into free cash. Uh, or sorry, 10% of free cash goes into stabilization. <laughs> but is that 10% that you'd otherwise use for capital? And now are you delaying a capital project or are you borrowing for a capital project that you could have otherwise paid cash for? Hmm. You could go either way on um, where you want to do with that sort of uh, percentage of your free cash. Some people do it into OPEB. Some towns fund, they say 75% of their free cash is for capital. Um, the last time I worked in, they took whatever was unexpended from their reserve fund, which was a larger dollar amount as a percentage of their budget, and that went to stabilization every year. So it was all right, they had a $175,000 stabilization fund, and whatever didn't get expended went into um, stabilization. So you can always set up policies or programs like that. Is one better than the other? Uh, it depends on what you're doing. If we're meeting all of our capital needs, sure. Do we take, uh, this year it would have been $340,000. It's not a bad idea to take it and throw it into stabilization. But is that $340,000 that we don't have to spend on capital? Or if we're, we have a short free cash year, does that mean that we're sort of really running our free cash balance down? Do we keep it in free cash? Do we put it in stabilization? They're all good options, and it, it's certainly a worthwhile discussion where we 
where we do it, there's not a singular best practice. It's how each community chooses to approach funding stabilization. One thing to consider is we have one more year before we've paid back our borrowing for the DPW, who's sort of an internal borrowing. Um, after that, even though it's not a giant increase, if you keep that $428,721, we should probably round it off, but if you keep that in the budget, in a five-year period, you've now dumped $2 million in your stabilization account. For a town our size and a budget our size, putting $400,000 in a stabilization every year is not a bad amount. Um, it's just we're paying back to get to a certain amount. So it'd be nice to supplement it with free cash, but do we supplement that? Do we supplement the retirement fund? Do we supplement OPEB? Do we do more capital and less borrowing to reduce the pressure or to free up room to borrow for, I don't say necessarily bigger projects, but more critical projects that we can absorb within the levy? They're all, they're all good options. Alan? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, if people are concerned about the, uh, uh, the look of uh, uh, asking, uh, you know, people from the audience to comment and the concern whether it's a violation of open meeting laws, there's a very simple way to address that, which is to simply post uh, all the uh, relevant boards as a meeting in addition to budget balancing. We did that last year. Well, I mean, we took comments and questions from the audience last year when it was a very critical period when we were trying to determine whether we wanted to do an override, what the amount of the override should be, and just to get the pulse of uh, not only people in the audience who are committee members, but also private citizens. So I think we should consider very strongly keeping the policy of uh, allowing uh, people in the audience who take the time to come to be allowed to comment and ask questions uh, during the meetings. I leave that to each individual chair of their board, whether or not they, you know, choose to post this as a meeting, mm -hmm. um, and they may make that decision partly based on how many members they expect to attend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it probably will confuse the public too, though. Mm -hmm. And it's not to undermine the whole purpose of this board. But correct. <clears throat> I think Mr. Plasco's comment, correct me if I'm wrong, was, was specific to the board members. I don't think it was an intention to not allow members of the public. That's always sort of the committee or the chair's discussion. Um, I think the larger discussion is if four members of the school committee are going to be here and they're going to talk about the school committee budget, it's what, why do we have a budget balancing committee that's two members from each committee? That's the, mm -hmm. the way we're trying to make it work. But um, you can always take these on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any other questions from, the, from anybody? Did you, did you want to discuss the option two proposal that was before the FinCom Monday night? Sure. Um, <laughs> I guess I could do that. The, so the, the budget as it's proposed. On what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, I have extra copy. This, I believe, may have just been sent to the FinCom, so I'm not sure who actually has it. I think it came to its okay. committee as well, but one. yeah. I think it came to us as well, but I, I didn't must, print I it have for one today. My, yeah, <laughs> I have one my somewhere. Bag. We can look on it together. Yeah. So you can have this one. <laughs> we'll call this an option two proposal. Um, we can go make more copies if folks, should we go make more copies? Or We had 50 or something at one point. <laughs> I see never again, but. Okay, so really uh, to sum, summarize what option two was, we have the budget as presented. Um, Dr. Thompson and I have had quite a few conversations over the last weekend about um, the out of district costs and roughly what that number is um, in terms of sort of croaking the school budget this year. So there's an option to increase that number. Uh, we can get it up to around 1.48 million. So uh, currently in the budget, there's $800,000 that's proposed that would go to cover some of the costs of these 800, uh, these out of district placements. And again, that, that number came from um, conversations Dr. Thompson and I had about what, what is your number? So all right, you're, you're, you're getting a hit, what's the number? And he um, originally it was, we knew we had three high cost cases that's around 750 to $800,000. And then later he said the number's closer to 1.3 to 1.6 million, somewhere around there, and sort of new costs that are uh, croaking the school budget this particular year. So we think we can get the number up to 1.48 million without really taking any financial hits to the town. And by that I mean you can always decide again, do you, do you put money here, do you put money there, where do you increase this, but you never want to hit that tipping point where you're making bad financial decisions or you're just setting yourself up for the future. We can get that number up to there and increase the override stabilization contribution from 600000 to 700000 by doing uh, three things. One is we would increase the projected local receipts to 92%. 
So we're still not at our, uh, our goal is 90, but getting even to 92% this year is still a good target. It's still good progress on where we've been. We still have that little bit of breathing room, uh, especially where some of those uh, local receipt numbers are, they can fluctuate 10 or 15% a year. The biggest number in there, excise tax, can easily fluctuate 10 or 15% in a year um, without us doing anything, just um, changes in values. Here we go. Uh, the second item would be as we move towards enterprise fund like accounting and we're trying to segregate out our pots of money to make sure that the light department pays for the light department, the water department pays for the water department, and the general fund pays for uh, schools and general government, we are, uh, and to do it in a way that doesn't croak everyone's rates, we've moved the light department pension cost. It's no longer being uh, in the shared cost column, and now it's being booked directly in the light department expenses. They then remove that as a write-off on their end. So if we're having a good year, they don't need to necessarily increase rates. Um, in a bad year, of course they can increase rates. And um, I always say this, everyone always asks me, is a light cost or a water cost going to cause a rate increase? 100% of any water and any light costs always come from the rates. And by trying to separate out the buckets, it's not going to impact the revenue that we get from our light operations or our water operations. What we're trying to make sure is that there's no cross-subsidization of water and sewer and the general fund and light in the general fund. It probably works to our favor in the general fund with the light department. Um, and we don't need to go towards having separate water community initiatives or sewer commissioners. It's just making sure that water and sewer rate payers are paying 100% cost of the water and sewer system and that the light department pays 100 cost of their system. That being said, what this does do is it frees up about a half a million dollars in the shared cost budget. We moved the indirects last year. We made one small adjustment to it this year. That's done. This year we're moving the pension. The proposal is to try to get there in five years. We'll do health insurance over the next two years. And then the final number will be sort of the, the workman's comp and the insurance numbers. We want to make sure we're not booking anything to our property tax levy that should be booked to a uh, enterprise fund because that also impacts the available levy dollars. Uh, some people might say you're just moving money from here to there, but it's important that these business-like functions are costed to their actual cost. You pay a rate for it, and we don't want any cross-subsidization. What that does is frees up about a half a million dollars in the shared cost budget. The proposal is uh, initially is that it's not reflected in the line item budget, but that half a million dollars would be used as a pension catch-up or an additional contribution to the pension system. We did this about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the compound interest we get from that over time is one of the reasons we're relatively well funded in the low 80% range. Um, that number over several years will help us beat our estimate or at least get there of being fully funded by 2029. We need to get fully funded plus on the pension system and then that number will come down precipitously and we'll be able to allocate that to OPEB. That's how we're really going to solve OPEB. We want to find as much money in other areas as the budget as we can, but that big number that's millions of dollars that we need to start putting towards OPEB is only going to come when the pension fund is fully funded and at a level that it can absorb a market shock. So originally the proposal is half a million dollars. Option two as we're calling it would only contribute an extra $250,000 and would move the other half of that dollar amount, $250 roughly, into, we'll call it the out-of-district placement line or out-of-district placement fund. The other item we would do is there are some salaries currently budgeted in the school budget for facilities positions. We are proposing out of revenues to create the facilities department, if you will. At about $600,000, that number is subject to a little bit of auditing up or down. Originally, the idea was the school positions that would be part of the shared department would stay in the school budget for the first year. And the budget as you have it now, I believe, does that. One of the sort of quirky things about that is we are looking at sort of creating some positions and moving some positions over. So what gets created is that person's going to actually move from the school department to over here anyway. So you wouldn't then backfill it. You can move the money any way you want it. But what we're talking about is $600,000 over here for new facilities money those positions stay in the school budget. <coughs> the FinCom over two meetings had some discussions that they felt that those the dollars for those positions, and let's think of them as dollars, is not necessarily positions. Uh, originally my proposal was just keep them in the school budget and the school superintendent can allocate them elsewhere. The FinCom seemed to <coughs> say they should go somewhere else. Um, if they were going somewhere else under this proposal, it would be to that out of district <coughs> placement fund. Since the school department will no longer need to fund the facility director's salary because that's being funded out of available revenue, um, to create the facilities department. That's about $230,000. And then uh, a decrease of those numbers would be increasing the override stabilization fund by $100,000. So we're able to free up some revenues for a critical need. My proposal is that some of those that we're freeing up, we should increase the override stabilization fund because now we're adding costs that we know we've got to bear down the road. 
the net impact of that, if everyone decided to go along with it, would be increasing that out of district fund or line to 1.48 million. Um, all these numbers are subject to a little bit of final mm -hmm. auditing, but that 1.48 target was based on um, Dave's estimate of roughly um, what his whack to his budget is. Now, could somebody make the argument that, well, gee, the school budget is supposed to be only going up 3.5%. Now you're increasing by 3.5% plus 600000 plus 1.4 million. Sure, you can make that argument. If I had an $800,000 cost I couldn't absorb coming to the general government budget, I'd be making the same argument. I'd be saying, look, it, I, sure, I can absorb this. I'm going to go lay staff off a year after we had an override. We don't want to move backwards. I'm fortunate this year, the general government budget, the life budget, the water budget, there's no giant unforeseen uh, uncontrollable cost that's hit them. The school department is particularly being hit hard. So on the one hand, we want to be cognizant of, you know, we don't want to be cute with our MOA and say, well, you know, if we read it this way, we don't really be able to do it. But I also don't think we want to go backwards just because of the agreement that we signed and where we're looking to be. I think by being conservative in our budget and everyone looking at it three and a half percent out the gate is one of the reasons we may have some funds to address and address, to invest and address some longstanding um, issues that we've been facing that hopefully we'll see the savings of down the road. Hopefully we'll be doing things better down the road. I'd like to think that um, you know five years of investing all that Student Opportunities Act money is going to make an impact. I'd like to think of five years of a facilities department is going to start to make an impact. And you know even if that 1.48 million number or whatever everyone settles on doesn't change, that's that's helping out that portion of the budget that often has some uncontrollable costs. We've also talked about do we create it sort of as like a reserve fund and you book costs to it and just keep that budget number in in a year as those numbers go up and down, you could certainly do that. What we don't want to do is say, well, let's absorb $1.5 million worth of costs in that line this year and then next year we say, well, it's only 1.3 and then you cut the line down and then a couple of years you say, well, I need to go back up to 1.7 and we don't have the revenue available. I think as you start to peel away those higher cost um, out of district placements, it helps us look at it differently and, and it really is something uncontrollable. Um, on the side of the school budget. So is it consistent with the pledge? I think that's that's up to um, that's up to interpretation. I don't think uh, the superintendent's putting forward a budget where he wants to increase it by X percent. It's here's new revenue tied to state dollars, and then here's a specific problem that has come up that is a giant budget driver. We have revenue available. Let's try to address that giant budget driver. Otherwise, there's nothing wrong with leaving revenue on the table, putting more money into stabilization. But are we then not making any progress in the school department and we just had a giant tax increase and added some revenue? I don't think we did that to tread water. I think we did that to try to move forward. So it's a catch-22. I'd hate to raise everyone's taxes and say, by the way, we're raising them again a lot the next year. But I'd equally hate to say, well, we raise your taxes and because we're sticking to um, the letter of a pledge and rather than the intent, we're also going to now go backwards. So sorry we jacked your taxes up, but we're going to just not do things as well as we wanted to. Certainly up to interpretation, this is my proposal to solve a problem that's been presented. I think um, it's worthwhile for the FinCom and the school committee and the selectmen and budget balancing to debate and discuss amongst themselves what they think the best path forward is. Mm -hmm. Mr. Palasco? My interpretation of the agreement is this is exactly what it was meant to do. Line six or paragraph six, the agreement yeah. will be reviewed for substantial changes are made to state funding, unfunded mandates having financial impact on other extraordinary unforeseen events. This is an extraordinary unforeseen event provided it can be back up with information to convince everybody that it is. This is just the type of flexibility we meant by that line as far as I'm concerned. It's also and I think we specifically talked about special ed being a wild card. Absolutely. Right. And and special special, special, special ed, ed, ed is, uh, is a mandate so and this yeah. is unfunded. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean there may be some stuff when you get some It'll be partially funded next year. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's not terribly it's, helpful. It's, it's fundamentally difficult to say we're going to hold the budget at 3.5%. I think we are, but you have these drivers that are not, you know, there's really something that's completely uncontrollable about them. So mm -hmm. we have the ability to solve the problem. You can make the same argument about the facilities department, but what we're not doing is just increasing budgets to bloat them and to grow them. Mm -hmm. We're looking at making some strategic investments to do things better. The whole point was let us do things better, let us move forward, and let us actually try to invest. M my own suggestion, and we haven't seen um, <coughs> the cherry sheets change much, the legislature's being the legislature about it. <laughs> if you go with the $1.4 million number, and the school budget can live within its 3.5% plus that $1.4 million number, if there's enough flexibility in there to not absorb 
some of that $600,000 for the Student Opportunities Act money, I would recommend try to make that all new programs and not just move money over. We have a unique, almost historic opportunity to actually try to invest in something. We should really give it a go mm -hmm. to actually try to invest and solve something. Things could change next year, things could change the year after. Um, chapter 70 is up, that's great, the economy's doing good, we've had years where it goes up, nothing. Right. So yeah. it, it, it's let's take a shot at actually solving problems. We're not looking to just spend money on these areas. They're underachieving students. They're special ed costs that are costing us a lot. Maybe we actually have a chance to finally move the needle on something. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tom, can I ask you a question? I just want to make sure I understand uh, the numbers. So when I'm looking at page four of our big packet, you've got the budget requests, and you have a number here for the schools of 52,311,691. Do you guys see where I'm talking yeah, about? Right yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, line 29. Yeah. So, as a but the the number we were looking at originally was fifty million nine hundred and eleven thousand six hundred and ninety one. I believe that was the three point five percent only. So I just want to make sure I understand what where this number came from and what's How in much this is it? number. Fifty two three eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's on this schedule. Okay. So this is the let me uh, get to the top. So this is the uh, schools and columns D and E. So uh, their base op operating budget going into last year was $44,999,330. On top of that, they, uh, the schools received the override for $4.7 million. Uh, and then they paid back the town into the override funds for 509290 leaving them with a uh, operating budget of 49 million 190040 uh, because we add uh, in the budgets you see when you print something from Eunice we add the uh, capital budgets to it I was just trying to prove to that 49 million 415 540 if you printed out the budgets right now but then the next one down is 49 190040 you'll see equals the operating budget that's up above in the same column? Yes. And then, uh, so that's kind of the operating budget, and then there's the 3.5% increase that everyone's talking about, which would bring you to 15,911,691. Right, right. Okay. And, then, <laughs> and, then on, and then on top of that, uh, the general manager had recommended that we fund the uh, uh, School Opportunities Act at $600,000, and that we provide $800,000 more in SPED tuitions. This is so option one. Option one. So that brings okay. it to 52311691, which is the number hopefully I have on the summary page. It is. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay, thank and you. And then what, what uh, Mr. Mazuka is proposing now, I believe, is to change. The eight hundred thousand to a million for something. Yeah, but you would delete the school base budget by two thirty, so yeah, we'd have to see what that. I, I think it's moving it around, so that bottom line number would go up by whatever the difference is six um, six eighty. Okay, so option two would increase the school target number. By approximately six hundred thousand. Yeah, I think it's six eighty is the number. But it might be six eighty less. You know, less the two thirty. His source of funding is that you're taking. You're not going to have to fund those facility budgets anymore. <clears throat> so we're taking that out of your base. Budget. Right, right, right. So it would be a net of six seventy less. Okay. Two thirty. I guess. <coughs> right, but then we'd also lose two hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of salary expenses. So it would sort of, in effect, kind of increase off. right by six hundred eighty thousand. Ball. I mean, these numbers are close, but I think the SOA number is is slightly under that. 
Um, and the facilities number that we have over on the right hand side is within twenty thousand dollars of what the final number is. So this is ninety eight percent accurate. Okay. Well, so there's a lot of think a lot to think about. There sure is. <laughs> um, I, just one other thing I wanted to state to everybody. Um, I think many of you know this already, but the the schools have been working on our budget. As you know, the, we have recently transitioned to Munis. We have recently transitioned the payroll to Munis. It's um, causing a fair amount of um, work to be to get everything into the proper accounts and things like that. So we are still working on the budget. The school committee has not approved a budget as of yet. We have added an extra March meeting, so we will be meeting a week from today and two weeks from today. And, and then the three week weeks from today, we will have our formal budget hearing. And then the day after that, the school committee will be coming back to FinCom. Um, so um, it, the, it's, it's kind of hard to have this conversation in some ways without the school committee having a better look at the budget. Mm -hmm. and if I could, so on the outer district, just to reflect mm -hmm. upon some comments that were received at the uh, FinCon meeting, um, that we had the discussion that we need to generate a mechanism whereby <coughs> whatever money that's uh, generating the 1.4 that's going to other district, we have. A, a mechanism that ensures that that goes directly there, whether it's some sort of written documentation, uh, so that the money cannot be spent elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that's something we should think about. But also, just going forward, not necessarily for this year, um, out of district has been um, uh, an issue for a number of years. We've we've had a lot of mechanisms for prepaying it, finding money from other sources, other fiscal years to prepay. And I think one of the mechanisms that I think we really at a, a point now we should look at is the establishment of a, of a, of a stabilization fund specific to uh, special education. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, the mechanism for that would be very transparent, and um, I think that will um, that would be given that this is a continual problem, not a problem, an issue. I think it's something mm -hmm. a challenge. Thank you. It's something that um, I'm not necessarily suggesting it for this year that we perhaps um, establish a fund. In reserve. Yeah, to Bob's point, what you could do is, um, as we try to build up a number to absorb these costs, you're going to have some years where it may come down. So you have two options. You can either say, well, move some other out of district placements into it, or next year the number goes down. Whatever's unexpended from it, you transfer into that reserve fund at the end of the year. That becomes the amount that you um, you do. What you probably want to do a reserve fund as opposed to a special purpose stabilization fund, just to um, make it easier than having to go back to. Um, and Tom meeting uh, with a two-thirds two vote and everything else? Yeah, yeah. You, you can. It, it does have some limits. You can only fund it with like 2% of the net school spending, so it has an automatic cap there. But the other mechanism, I think, is very <coughs> transparent. When you do expend from the fund, it does require the school committee and the board of selectmen both to vote the money out of to, to the, for these expenses, which I think is a very, very transparent uh, process. So, something yeah. to think about. Yeah, I think, I think something like that would be good for transparency and people would appreciate and yet we're making the funds available because <coughs> we know we have a real issue to address. <coughs> but was there also some discussion by some folks that uh, I wasn't involved with earlier about somehow also in the, uh, trying to be transparent that the new student opportunity mandates be tracked and kept separate somehow? There's so the way I identify that separate <coughs> from previous budgets? Briefly, the FinCom, I think, last Friday night, they talked about <clears throat> since that sort of new money towards new programs, you're basically going to craft the budget line for that and say this is the Student Opportunities Act. So you can clearly see where that money is being spent for that amount. I think that's very helpful. This is another reason I'd be hesitant to just bleed things into the budget. It lets us know where that money's going. It lets us always go back and track exactly what's in it. And if the state ever did come and say, you know what, we're doing away with Student Opportunities Act money, it, it's almost think of it like a grant that we think is permanent, but you'd be able to look at it separately. And I think that would also help to the average member of the public who says, well, wait a minute, why are you spending this above and beyond what you're doing? Well, the state has cl very clearly listed this $600,000 for these purposes. Well, you treat it almost like just another line in your budget, Student Opportunities Act budget for these three of these and whatever it happens to I, be. I endorse that very strongly in developing the budgets, whether um, obviously right in this first Pass. We're all trying to meet that. We know we have to, and we're always trying to get around it. But I think for the public and 
transparency throughout the whole process. It would be good if we all adopt that and work towards that. <coughs> Essentially, what we're already doing, right, on our spreadsheet. I, just right. <laughs> the budget subcommittee of yeah. the school committee yeah. has been looking at that, yeah. um, you know, with on a spreadsheet. Now, how did that actually works in Munis in terms of the mechanism for tracking there? That's a well, separate question. That well, was way is, above my pay grade. If yeah. There's a lot of accounts that have to be hit, and they have to be, you know, some at district wide, some at each school. Mm -hmm. Right. Then, you know, perhaps we could just uh, start the description of the account as SOA. Team, that's and what then, I was saying. And then when we can dump everything into Excel, sort sort by the descriptions and isolate that. So yeah. I think we could do that and still maintain the Desi numbers that that Karen need, needs to yeah. do reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, whereas it's only six hundred thousand dollars, it wouldn't be too hard when you're going to figure out a system to track it easily. There weren't too many ident um, accounts identified on the sheet today, right? No, but yeah. I think we're, no. yeah. No, they fall into the different areas. Crossover. And that's at some point, as Desi said, how they want it sort of reported at the end of the year. Oh, we're still waiting for the template to put it in. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you add five years from now, well, that's what I'm saying. If, if, if you add a position under Student Opportunities Act at a particular school, is it part of that that school's budget, or is it they want to see it separate? I, I guess we'll have to. We, we can figure out internally right. with Munis. There's ways we can do it. Whether it's you, you, you flag a specific account, or you just open it up like it's another department. The student opportunity department, here's your salaries number, here's your operating number. We can we can make it work so that we can be clear about what's in there. Mm -hmm. We'll create another school. <laughs> create another school. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, can I just go back to the shared cost for a, a second? Uh, sure. Just uh, I just want to make people aware that uh, Blue Hills notified us that they have 30 new students. Is that right? They have an increase of a net 15. Net, excuse me, you're right. Net of 15 mm -hmm. new students over at Blue Hills, which is costing us in a shared cost an additional $330,000 a year. There's only like the two districts, two, two communities that have an increased assessment from Blue Hills, and we're one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a concern we had with yeah. the, the timing of the override yeah. that there would be students who would opt to go there. Right. Because 15 is an unusually high number. It's right. It's typically two or three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it goes up yeah. or down. Yeah. I'm sorry, what number did you say? 15, was? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. 280,000? Was it 280? I think so. So what is the, the will of this committee? Um, mm -hmm. This year is totally different than we've done budget balancing in the past. We've started much later, which allows us to have much better estimates that we're looking at. Um, but it does mean that we need to wrap up fairly quickly because we need to get the town meeting booklets going and things like that. Um, but um, we have a couple of options before us, and we don't yet have a complete school budget. So curious about thoughts on how to proceed. Just one um, thought. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, 285,000 for Blue Hills. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Doc. Second sorry. thought. Um, I know the school committee hasn't completed a budget yet. I still think budget balancing, if people need more than one meeting or if they need more time, but could still pick sort of a number. I mean, that's sort of what budget balancing should be doing. And, and the specific details of how the SOA Act money is spent is really the school committee and the superintendent. But um, if there's even a thought on which of the two budget options that look better or <coughs> other suggestions, it's, it's up to the committee. Um, some guidance to the staff would be appropriate. I know the school committee has to compare a budget, but if they don't know generally what budget balancing is supporting for a number, it's hard to go back and say this is what the, the budget looks like. The general government budget's balanced, so it's, you know, easy for me. But. I think uh, as long as we decide those couple options and the lines are affected by those options, You've got a budget. You internally have to come to that number, but right. town wide, that's your budget. Right. So, <laughs> right. Right. You know, we, we we haven't disagreed that it's over the three and a half percent because of extraordinary rate. Right. Right. So that's your budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So we do have your budget. We don't have the detail, but we have your budget. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. Really, we're deciding on the big numbers and where the money's coming from and how we're funding the overall budget. So we have two things: which options to use that you just talked about. Correct. And where to come up with two hundred eighty grand for Blue Hills. Uh, Blue Hills is factored well, in the budget. Oh, it's 
yeah, 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 bottom line. Yeah, just as, as we're just pointing out that it went up. Yeah, yeah, because we had talked about what All right, one problem was solved. new with in shared time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that problem was solved. <laughs> just one other comment about the, the, the um, out of district, where the 1.4, you refer to it as an up, up, more or less an upset limit. That number could change, could it not, as you go through your further analysis? It could. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, we have found that the out of district is constantly changing. Sands. Yeah, I, I would anticipate there'll be some final modification of the numbers that we can get out the budget balancing. Maybe they meet again before town meeting. Um, again, I know the SOA number is maybe fifteen thousand dollars less than that, so we'll get the actual number. We'll wait till we're a little more in the cherry sheets. The facilities number that's proposed here is it's within twenty thousand dollars. I got to take one more look at the the account lines. There's nothing major that's changing though. But if you come back and it's one point five two, I don't know if we can find that money. Or we can, or if it's one point four two, or if you go with option one. <coughs> is there a further discussion or a motion? Or a I guess the clarifying question um, that I think some of the school committee might have. So, Tony or anybody, um, with the proposal to remove the facility salaries for 230, how does that impact the MOU that we already signed for the facilities department? So, we'd have to take a look at it because we originally said we would keep the salaries in the school budget. Yep. <coughs> but if the boards agree, uh, the MOU can be changed. I mean, I, I generally wouldn't put something like that in an MOU. I know there was concern. We didn't want to just merge budgets together. Yeah. But we had available resources, and whereas those positions are people who are moving into sort of slightly changed positions, mm -hmm. it's sort of we're not, we're not going to necessarily backfill them. I mean, one of them is the facilities director's position, so we're, the school's not going to backfill that position. So right. it, it, we can update that MOU. There's no legal requirement that forces us to do that, but if everyone will feel more comfortable saying, okay, here's the new sort of understanding as we've now looked at it, we've looked at our available revenues. Paul and Dave and I have met a lot in the last couple of months to try to get that, that number is tied to it. They gave about the documents, how we're going to make it work year, year one and really day one. So mm -hmm. now that we have that, we could always go back and we look at that. It's, but again, with the same people moving over, it's sort of, they can keep them in there. We're just not necessarily going to backfill them. Right. Because there was... I don't have it in front of me, but there was some language and stipulations around like coming back to the table after the first year before the salaries moved in agreement to continue moving forward. Yeah, we, that I don't think we would change. So, so let's say for some reason we're not predicting this. Um, Paul and his team are excited to take this on. We're trying to make it work. We know it'll be a good thing for everyone. But let's say for some reason we wanted to. We've allocated $600,000 of general fund revenues to cover the cost of that department. Mm -hmm. Those, I think, would get split back into where they came from, which in this case, it's it's... The two hundred thirty thousand out of the school department would go back there because those positions would move back over. Okay, okay, that helps. Thank and there'll, there'll be, you know, there'll be more moves to that number whether we move things in or out. I know Paul and I have worked on. He thinks if the DPW takes on certain items, mm -hmm. he can move two of his groundsmen to do some um, to be craftsmen. We think we can do that. We're not ready to make a budget move because it's sort of a, on paper it looks mm -hmm. great. And we think we can do it, but we got to try it for a while before we say let's move it in. Mm -hmm. So we can revisit the MOU once a budget is set, but I don't think there's any substantial. Um, changes there. Um, okay. Thank you. Right. <coughs> Sim similarly, on the uh, reduced pension catch up, so we had a, some money in there to catch up. He increased it additionally 500. Uh, no, now so you want to reduce the 250? No, sorry, we have not had a, we did a one time pension catch up about 10 or 12 years ago. The, this budget, it doesn't show on the line, we just hadn't added it in, is a half a million dollar pension catch up. Instead of doing a half a million dollars, we would just do a quarter of a million dollars. So but it's, it's not cutting an existing line out of the budget. We're still working towards a catch-up program. Uh, correct. So the amount of 250 grand. So next year, we'll be moving um, some of the health insurance costs over. That will free up money in the shared cost budget. Does it go to OPEP or does it go to the pension? My suggestion would be put it at that pension catch-up. Get that number up to an extra million dollars. And now we're contributing 20% of, um, on top of our minimum. That's going to really start to help us get caught up so there's future opportunities to continue <laughs> growing that uh, that number and again it's you can have that argument do you put it in stabilization do you put it in OPEP we know that if we can contribute heavily to the pension system we're well funded 82 or 84 percent once we can solve that problem and it's solvable within our lifetime we start having the option to start solving other issues so it's about <coughs> where can we make the dollars thank you yes so 
um, back on the other district again, just the <laughs> earlier point. Perhaps for our next meeting, we could, uh, someone could be tasked with the, a drafting a memorandum of understanding or agreement rather in terms of um, um, if it should be funded at the 1.4 million level, um, the parties will agree that it will be specifically used for the purpose of um, special ed out of district spending. <laughs> So, so that sounds fun. like a great idea. <laughs> we, we, we I'd be happy to have you do it. Yeah. I know I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Is there a second to that nomination? <laughs> sure. All those in favor? Uh, um, if the committee, you don't have to decide now if you want time to reflect. If you do have an option or a uh, thought on the budget as presented to you or the alternate budget option two, um, I know that would help Tom in putting the whole budget together and would certainly help, I think, Dr. Thompson and his team in knowing, um, mm -hmm. you know, what his budget number so actually just is. just a logistical question. So you can, you can say this money has to be used for special ed, but since the school committee has the ability to move things in and out of circuit breaker, like, what real control do you have over that? Well, well, you just only, ask local, the, only local politically that if they violated that agreement mm -hmm. next year, they don't get much cooperation or additional funds. You just ask for a list of the sorry. You just ask for a list of the transfers. I mean, that's an easy thing to show. Show what's booked to that account, and then say, you know, if, if it's all right. Well, there's 1.4 million dollars in there, and five new English teachers at the Oldham were booked in there. You would know, and you would say, well, wait a minute, this isn't what we're supposed to do. I mean, that's what you'd be doing if it was a special reserve for, um, for out of district. You would, you would have to have the list of expenditures to be voted on by both the school committee and the Board of Selectmen. So you remember that process. Right. But Tom does raise a good point that by state law, the school committee has bottom line authority for that, which is why I think some communities do create this separate special education reserve, which has additional controls on it and additional. One needs. of the things that we said in the five year projection was that. Uh, the school committee has $1.8 million in reserve that they were going to distribute 300000 a year more. So mm -hmm. is, that, is that still in the plan? Oh, we've gone through have, a lot of that already. We have to exceed that in order to get even close. Okay. So we're going to be uncomfortably close to well below that, meaning if we had another move in like we had this year, we would be in trouble. Sometimes people move out too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, well, I'm pretty sure it's, sure it's a one-way gate. That's been my yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? So when we're talking about the, out of, the, the language around special education, are we saying the fund is specifically for out of district or special education? Because with the move-ins, it's not just students who move in that go out of district that are becoming a challenge in our budget. It's a lot of the move-ins who are in district, but increasing. Like when we came to FinCom, all the special education mandate positions that you know we said are above our apples to apples <laughs> comparison. That um, my understanding was is in talking district. specifically about out of district placements. Okay. Um, the only challenge here being that special ed as a whole becomes sort of a big encompassing term, and then I think from my conversations with Dave, we're targeting the out of district placements because once you start absorbing the higher cost ones, they're, they're mandatory costs. They're also not services we could do anything different with. I mean, the okay. real high cost cases, we couldn't come up with a program to, to take care of them in the district. So I think as you start absorbing that in that number, mm -hmm. and maybe you grow it, it's really the items that the school department couldn't really otherwise handle anything else on. It, mm -hmm. Almost okay. a cost you don't have that control over, whereas some of the lower cost cases, you might be able to come up with a program, you may not. I think we're targeting the ones that we know we can't really Okay. We couldn't offer a program. Okay. And I think it helps sell it to the public to say, look, if these are required out of district <laughs> placements, really the higher cost ones. And I don't know if you could set a cost and say it's ones over $100,000 or over $75,000, the ones that are really, really budget busters where we just don't have a choice. I mean, I always think of an example of a student who's blind where um, we just probably could never have a program like that in-house. Sometimes you might be able to. I know one or two districts that have, but the, the hospitalizations and the full-time mm -hmm. residential care, those are things we're never going to have a, an in-house, an in-district right. program for. And right. would this include the transportation for out-of-district? I would think so. I would assume it's, at least my assumption was it's, it's if you, if your total cost for that student is $80,000 and it's a $60,000 tuition and $20,000 in, in transportation, to me, I don't see why not. Okay. So are we, I'm just trying to keep up with all the movies. There's many different meetings. Are, so are we saying with the MOU, that Bob is working on. That is different from a reserve fund? Sorry, this, I got a list. No, I, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's gonna, um, 
I think we're, whether we call it special education, or I think we're thinking the out of district placements, we would a fund to address those items we don't have otherwise funding for, those big ticket special ed, out, out, mm -hmm. big ticket out of district costs. Okay. I, we, our goal is not to create something that's so restrictive that it doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. It's just, the idea would be you're gonna craft a one and a half million dollar budget line what do you do if you have money left at the end of the year? Mm -hmm. Allocate that in the following year to a reserve fund, or I mean, you could let it go to free cash, but allocate it to a reserve or special purpose stabilization, so you know that's the first place that you go to. Mm -hmm. I've gotten confused. Too. <laughs> Are we duplicating effort here? Is there a special reserve mechanism? We don't have anything that's. Thing? We don't have anything that's called a reserve fund. What we have is the circuit breaker account. Mm -hmm. And the state allows circuit breaker money to roll over by one year. So money that is you know, received in FY21 mm -hmm. can be spent in FY21 or FY22. We budgeted $2.1 million in circuit breaker um, revenue for the FY20 budget. Mm -hmm. We got roughly that amount from the state. It was actually a little bit less, but it but we had we had some carryover money from the year before. And you know, in practice what we do is we always spend the carryover money first and then whatever's left for this year carries over to the next year. So there is a little bit of a buffer. We as Tom said, we did start when we were doing the five year projections for for the override, we were looking at, we had like a 1.58, 1.5, something like that, million dollars carryover balance in Circuit Breaker. This year, because we have seen, been hit with such large out of district tuitions in FY20 that were not budgeted, um, we have had to eat into <coughs> that. So originally we had said we thought we were going to have like $1.2 million at the end of this year, and we now think we're going to have about 600000 Karen's got numbers for us. Yeah. Um, That's what we did, right. So yeah, the the latest is we think we would have about eight hundred thousand at the end of um, FY twenty. Mm -hmm. But then if we, but we are also projecting our budget as it stands now includes taking some additional of that, so we'd have about five hundred thousand at the end of FY twenty one. So we've been, you know. Right. Chipping away at that, and that that does serve as it's not officially a reserve account. It's only allowed to carry over one year, but it is the mechanism that schools have available to them to deal with these sudden fluctuations. Well, I was talking about a reserve that the FinCom selectmen had to approve. Yes. Uh, FinCom, I mean the, um, the, the selectmen in the, in the um, school, school committee. committee. So, uh, so you're saying right? you're saying if we we get to the May. Special town meeting. I guess someone's projecting you're going to have so much money left that you would transfer two hundred thousand well, into I, this fund. I, I think what we're talking about, or at least what I'm talking about, is we're we're trying to target a cost this year. Mm -hmm. That number is going to fluctuate. Rather than just trying to have it go like this every year, because you can never predict it. If you have a year where it's lower, you wouldn't lose that money. You would just say transfer it into that stabilization but account. I'm saying mechanically, you would do it at the May special. Sure. I mean, I think Bob's going to work on it, and I go, what the specific mechanism is, I think we're looking at, we're able to allocate money for this problem. If we see a short-term savings in there, we want to make sure we're saving it for the year where it becomes $1.8 million, but we only have $1.5 budgeted mm -hmm. to absorb, you know, your highest 10% of either district placements or whatever it happens right. to be. Although, so, so can I, can, so just to, just, we've had this conversation about circuit breaker. So we had three students move in that needed a full day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, residential placement at about $250,000 a year. A okay. piece. Each. A piece. Each. 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 So $750,000. We were lucky in that they moved in after April 1st, so the districts, the sending districts still had to foot that bill. We own that bill next year. Okay, so when I say that, you know, when I said before, you need to have a certain amount in circuit breaker to have that flexibility, otherwise you're coming to a special town meeting to ask for a fund transfer. So <coughs> if, if there is a reserve account, that need decreases. But easily this year we needed to have, if, if, that, if those families had moved in in February, 
that would have been another 800,000 out of our existing circuit breaker. So I think that's important that people realize that, that the state re is reimbursing extraordinary special education <coughs> costs. We need to provide a quality education to these students. They deserve that. That is our, that's, that's what we do. And I'm not questioning any of that. <coughs> but when that happens, when you have an extraordinary cost, we do not get the reimbursement for those expenditures until the following year. And even then, you don't get 100%, right? And even then, you do not get 100%. So on a $250,000 person, the schools pay the first 45000 mm -hmm. 45000 And then what's remaining, the state will reimburse at some percentage, 70 to 75. Up to 75%. So, so you're still paying 45000 plus 25% of 250. Yeah. Right. So, but even in the long run, it's, it's a big hit. Right. You know, in general, I'm very in favor of the idea of a special education override fund, I, a stabilization fund. Or I would not, um, I don't want to see our circuit breaker carryover number go all the way to zero mm -hmm. because it would, re, you know, things happen quickly and sometimes we just need to be able to fund something. But one thing is, even having it at less than 500,000 makes the schools really nervous because the state has this program of extraordinary relief. If your out of district tuitions go up by more than 25%, then they will help you out that year. But we're looking at out of district tuitions of about $6 million. So 1.5%, I mean, 25% of that is $1.5 million. We could be 1.5 million, we could be $1.4 million over mm -hmm. the budget, mm -hmm. and the state wouldn't mm -hmm. help us out at all. Mm -hmm. So it feels like we really need to have to know that there's some cushion there. So some cushion could stay in our circuit breaker rollover, and then some could be in this you know, special education reserve account, which would have the additional controls of having to requiring a vote of the Board of Selectmen and the additional transparency that goes with it. But that would give the schools the, con the confidence that we don't have to call special town meeting in order to pay our bills. <laughs> So I was thinking we we're going to wrap it up tonight. I think we need at least one more meeting. <laughs> I think maybe we do. <laughs> well, I think if I, I agree, and I have to get off to a dance lesson in a few minutes. Um, the the specific mechanism yeah, needs to be, <laughs> the specific mechanism needs to be worked on. I don't necessarily know if budget balancing needs to wait for the specific mechanism to be completed because that may take time. Mm -hmm. um, from my perspective, I'm looking at are the dollar amounts acceptable to budget balancing and what we're trying to achieve with it. If we delay, it could be a couple of weeks, four, five, six weeks before we know the exact mechanism, we got to play with the language and we're going to want to have a lot of meetings. And I think addressing in that way is important. <coughs> we can have it by our meeting. If, it, it, it happen, but if the budget balancing committee leaves without at least an endorsement of one number or another, um, Dave still doesn't know how to put a budget together. Right. So is there a thought on the option one, option two question? Move we endorse option two. All right. Is there a second? No, oh, second. All right. Any further discussion? All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. And then I think the next thing is do we want to think about having scheduling another meeting <clears throat> before the budget is due to the you know, printer. the printer, or do we want to wait till after? Did I miss the printing date? Did you go over that? Well, um, basically, by the end of March, everyone has to have the detailed budget. It would, um, I think it'd be helpful because we'll have sort of a we'll recalculate the numbers based on this, uh, based on the budget balance and committee's endorsement. We'll true up the SOA number we know is, is within twenty thousand dollars. The facilities number is within ten or twenty thousand dollars of the final number. Um, so that it would probably be good to have sort of a final look at what it's like. Um, two weeks or? Well, two weeks from tonight, we have a school committee meeting. Yeah, no, no, mm -hmm. name, please. <laughs> right. Um, um, what about Tuesday the 17th? I know it's St. Patrick's Day, but the selectmen are not meeting that day. Um, I'm not getting a nice look from my colleague across the table who thought he had a night off. But, uh, <laughs> I think I've already read three other proposals. They're not locked down. Yep, yet. That, that would work for me. You could be first. Well, I'm sorry. Tuesday the 17th. St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. 
taxes today? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I can do it. I was planning on attending the Blue Hills meeting, but... Um, what time is the Blue Hills seven. meeting? Well, we do we want to meet by 7 o'clock? Yeah, do we want to meet again at, at 5.30 again and Over. try and uh, get so through I'm it? this ringing a bell here. Hold on. We'll start a little earlier that day. Can we start a little earlier? Are people able to? Well, yeah, what time do you... hard for me. 5.30 is about as early as I can get. Okay. I work at night. <laughs> what, what, would you, what, would you, what would you propose? How much earlier? I mean, even just half hour earlier, if, if possible. Yeah. Okay. So 5 o'clock? 5 o'clock on Tuesday, March 17th. And what are you thinking for how long? I don't think it would take that long, right? You know, That's about the only no, thing no, that we're going to be talking about. Unless <laughs> yeah, something raises its ugly head. 59 minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's at 5, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for 5. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything further? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. You got it. All right. Second. I second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you very much.